Blender 4.2 is now out and there are some big changes and some really nice features. This video is about the things that you need to know before updating so you're ready for those changes that might kind of break your projects if you're not. So to start with, when do you upgrade? Straight away or do you wait? Well, there are some fantastic things in the new version, particularly the long-awaited EV Next, a new render engine making EV a bit more like Cycles. But it will change the look of your renders, so mid-project updates could be a bad idea. You may have to end up changing lots of your lighting if you want it to work in the same way as it used to, unless you're using Cycles, of course, and then it's okay to update. If you are following along with any courses, then you can probably upgrade, but there are a couple of interface changes, particularly when rendering, so do be aware of that. But if you watch the rest of this video, you can see what those changes are and be ready for them. So let's take a look at the vital changes that you need to know about. So the first thing to point out is that when you go onto the Blender site, you can see Blender 4.2, long-term support, there for download. But something important right next to that is what's new. If I click on that, you've got all the new features within Blender 4.2. Now, if I scroll down, you can see some of these features, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But scrolling down further, all the way down where it says extensions and add-ons, is the first thing I want to quickly point out. Add-ons are very slightly different. It shouldn't really break your project, but it's important to know how they work now. The important bit here is that you've got this extensions.blender.org page or site. If I click on that, you can see all the add-ons that are available and you can see all here and you can scroll through them and there's pages and pages. It's quite nice because you can see a visual representation of your add-on. So how does this affect Blender? Well, let's jump into Blender. I'll go to edit preferences and firstly take you to add-ons and show you that there are a few add-ons that ship with Blender. So Node Wrangler, worth making sure that's ticked, and I'll be using that in this session. Also Rigify, I use lots, and they come shipped with Blender. However, if I go to Get Extensions now, you can see that I get this message about internet access being required, and that's to install and update online extensions. And that's kind of the important bit. So I'll allow access, and now I can start installing the add-ons that I need, which we looked at in the list earlier. So the point of this being that it makes the Blender file a little bit smaller, because it doesn't have to ship with all these add-ons, and they're easily updatable. If you don't like this connection to the internet, you can go under Systems, and under Network, turn that Allow Online Access off. You'll see now when I go back to Extensions, it's saying you need to be connected, and I can turn it on here. So although that won't break your project, it's worth understanding about how add-ons now work in case you're looking for them or searching for them. So I'll close this down and let's start looking at the next part of Blender. I'll just quickly make a new scene. So I'll delete the default cube as always, add in a monkey, control three to add a subdivision surface modifier with three levels. Go to side view, zoom in and position that so it's sitting on the floor and I'll add in a plane for the floor. And then we'll go across to the shading workspace. So currently I'm in EV for the rendering and I'm in material preview mode. The interesting thing is we've got a shadow. A material preview mode isn't actually affected by this light. If I click on this light and move it down, you can see it's not having any effect on our shadow. The shadow is actually coming from the HDRI in the background. If I take you across to render preview, because I haven't put an HDRI in, we can only see the effects of this light. And if I press G to grab, we can now start seeing that shadow. I'll continue to use render view to explain a few more things. So I'll set up an HDRI for myself. So into the shader editor, to the world tab, press the home key to zoom in on my nodes. I'll select the background one and with the node wrangler installed, I'll press control T. That brings in an environment texture with a mapping node included. I'll open up one of my HDRIs. I'll start off with a really bright one that has a really direct light like this Alps field from Polyhaven and open that. And immediately you can see the shadow of the HDRI. And if I go to the mapping node and rotate around the Z axis, as I move around, you can see the influence of that on the object and the shadows. Now, if I take you across to the world tab here and take you down to the settings, that's because now we have the sun option, which identifies a sun, as it were, in the HDRI. And we've got this shadow option here, which I can turn on and off. So that's great and something new and worth being aware of. To talk about the next aspects, I'll take you back to object mode in the shader editor. I'll set up a material for my monkey. I press new and just briefly, there is a new thin film option in the principled BSDF. I won't talk about that because that's something you can play around with. It doesn't really break anything. What I'm going to do with the monkey is turn the roughness almost off and turn the metallic up so it's nice and shiny like this. I'll press right click and shade smooth. I'll click on the floor and change this to a different color as well. So something like a nice blue around here, maybe a tiny bit darker. 
And for this, I'll turn the roughness up so there's no reflection. Now what you'll notice is that the reflections in my monkey are just of the HDRI in the background. We can't see the reflections of the floor. We should see blue all along the underneath if this floor is being reflected. So we'll go across to the render settings. And what we have now is a ray tracing option. If I tick this, you can see the difference that makes. Suddenly we've got all that blue being reflected. But one thing you might notice if I tick on the ray tracing and turn it on and off, you can see that it goes a little bit soft, but it's not bad in its default mode. Let's open up the ray trace settings. One of the things that can improve it is the resolution, making it full resolution. That might make a bit of a difference. The other thing you might want to play with is the actual denoising here. If I turn off the denoising, we get that sharpness back, but the reflections are a little bit noisy. But it does depend on the type of object you've got, whether you want that denoise on or off. In this instance, off is very slightly better, I think. So that's the first major change, getting those reflections to work. But also with these reflections, we have global illumination. I'll explain that further. I'll press Shift A to add, mesh and then plane, G to grab in the X and move that across, and R, Y, 90 to rotate it around. I'll scale it up a bit as well. Now, first of all, the reflections. You can see this reflected in the object, but what happens when I move across to here? The reflections disappear. I'll actually give this a bit of a color. So let's change it to, let's say a purple, and we can see those reflections more easily. You should also be able to see a bit of global illumination on the floor. So I'll just change this roughness, the roughness of this wall to one, and the floor is one as well. So there's a little bit of global illumination coming from the purple here. Now, if I zoom out and move around the object, see what happens to the floor here and the reflections here. As I move around, you should be able to see a little bit of a difference in the floor. If I make the floor a bit darker, you can see that having more of an influence there. So the purple on the floor, you should be able to see there. And you'll see it a little bit more when I add some detail to this ground. But the point being, as soon as this plane is not visible to the camera or in the viewport, the effects of that in reflections and for global illumination stop working. That's because EV Next is screen-based, so you have to see it for it to have an effect. So this is something particularly important if you're setting up an animation where you want to move around your objects, you're going to see a lot of flicker as it moves past certain areas and stops having an effect and re-establishes that effect. The same will happen if I zoom in and we stop seeing that wall there, we stop seeing the effect. Zoom out a touch and move around, we'll see it. Now I'll illustrate this a little bit further showing another great feature of EV Next. Again, I'll add in a plane, so Shift A, Mesh and then Plane. RY90, scale it down a bit and just move it to the side. And for this one, new material, and I'll change the emission. I'll change the strength to 30, so it's nice and bright and we can instantly see that. And let's change the color to this time, we'll go for a green. So instantly you can see now that emissive objects work in Eevee, they actually give off light, which is wonderful. If I move this around, you can see the light having an effect on all our objects. However, once again, if I move to a different position and move across like this, we get the light the other side, but no light this side. So it is, again, screen based. So there's limitations, but it does look fantastic. Let's just quickly change this to cycles. I'll just jump to my GPU, turn on the denoise, so it's a bit faster. So cycles, EV, and you can see EV's looking pretty good, and it is real time. So big changes in EV there that could break your project unless you're aware of them. So do be aware of those changes and limitations. Now, something else that could make a big difference to your scene, if I select the floor and choose the principal BSDF with the Node Wrangler installed, I'll hold down Control, Shift and press T and go across to my textures and add in a mud floor. So I've got a PBR material. It's got the diffuse, the displacement, the normal and the specular. I'll bring those in and it hooks them up with the Node Wrangler, which is nice. I've got the color there, the specular actually going to the specular. I could change that to the roughness, but it's not going to make too much difference. The normal down the bottom here and the displacement. So now within Eevee, we can actually use real time displacement, which is fantastic. Now you'll notice it's not working at the moment. In order to get this to work, we can go to the material properties here and scroll down to settings. You can also find that if you press N in the shader editor and go to options and then settings. Under displacement, same here we've got displacement and bump. As soon as I press that, you can see the displacement having an influence. So it's moving it up here. And the scale setting, if I move that up and down, you can see the displacement is having an effect. 
But of course, because this is a plane with only four vertices, the effects are limited. You need to add more vertices to get the most out of a displacement. So I'll press Control-3 to add a subdivision surface modifier. Let's just quickly go to the modifier. I'll turn that right up actually to five and you can start to see the effect there. I'll change it to simple as well so we keep our plane. Still not quite enough in terms of the vertices added. So what I'll do, I'll jump into edit mode, right click, subdivide, and just give it 10 subdivisions. And now you can see the detail in the mud. Back to object mode and let's play with my scale and you can see real time displacement. Isn't that fantastic? And you can actually start to see a little bit more of the effect of that global illumination there in this area, as long as I can see my purple in here. And as I move it across, it disappears and comes back again. Again, that limitation of EV Next. So there's that real time displacement, which I think could make a big difference to your projects and the way you work in EV. And of course, now you've got the knowledge of how the ray tracing and the global illumination works. So you know what to look out for and how hopefully to get the most from it. I hope that was helpful to you. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.